Sean and again thank you very much for for the invitation and I'm very thankful to the university and I'm happy to, to be with a group of friends and people such as Adrian and Gonzalo and Sean. No? Thanks a lot. Uh, look, I'm the last one today so it's going to be an effort and a challenge to keep everybody awake in this half an hour. What I would like to do is to share with you some reflections and insights on, by the way, some of the topics that have been discussed regarding bilateral issues between or binational uh, issues such as Argentina and Brazil and the relationship to, to China. No? And specifically regarding a, a recent book that we published you, in Spanish, unfortunately, but that you can download fully from uh, our center and from, from this uh, recently created academic network. What I want to do is to, let's see, this one, no, it's this one, there we go. So uh, some of the topics, I have a longer presentation, some of the, I will skip some of the issues, and somehow I will try to relate also to some of the topics that have been discussed uh, today in the morning uh, in the, and in the afternoon. No? Uh, the issue of foreign direct investment personally and at our center is not new. We've been working uh, like few other uh, centers, I believe, in the last 10, 15 years on foreign direct investment in Mexico together with people such as Michael Mortimer from ECLAC. Uh, uh, the second is White Book. Again, all these you can download from our center. Some papers also in English if you are interested. Uh, together with the public sector in Mexico. Uh, and we very strongly believe, I would say, uh, on, on a analytical and methodological uh, research to at the macro level, at the meso level, at the micro level, and at the territorial level. This is elasticities as in our graduate school, we have a good relationship with macroeconomists, but elasticities are not sufficient to understand the country, not even to say a sector, etc. No? Uh, recently, as part of our work, we created this thread, uh, this academic network on Latin America and the Caribbean on China, four books regarding 80 documents from people from Cuba, Argentina, including also Adrian, but uh, of course from China, the United States, with different views and perspectives that to, related to a relationship uh, with uh, China. No? Uh, and this is the book that we published a few weeks ago, uh, La, the China's FDI in Latin America, 10 case studies. No? Uh, Literature, I think there is a good group of people. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time again. So you have institutions such as the Inter-American <coughs> Development Bank, CEPAL, ECLAC, of course also in China, MOFCOM, the Ministry of Economics, eh, of Commerce or Trade. There, is, there are some articles of, the, of this network. Sechimex is another institution, Centro Studios China, Mexico, and the group of other authors that have been working on this issue of of the or overseas foreign direct investment. No? I would tell you and related to the, some of the topics we have been discussing today, on each of these bullets we could have a seminar. No? But three or four <coughs> topics that might be interesting. No? I would first of all uh, highlight uh, the issue of the well-known topic of the pragmatism of Chinese policy makers. No? And uh, there is a, a very dear uh, ambassador, Eugenio Anguiano, who was twice ambassador of Mexico and China. He is very meticulous and he has been in the last decades looking at the degrees and specialization uh, of policy makers in China. No? And I would simply point to the direction of, of some of the reflections based on the, his work also, 
Uh, I would say that in Latin America, vis-a-vis -vis China, you have a beautiful and very challenging discussion of policy makers, most of Latin America, that come from Ivy League institutions in the United States, from Chicago, Stanford, Oxford, uh, Harvard, MIT, etc., with an A-level uh, at their PhDs, no? and so you switch from being a president such as Mexico and going then back to Harvard or Cedillo going to Yale, etc., etc. Very good in their theoretical work. Uh, of course, always having difficulties of getting from point A to point B. No? We have good discussions regarding if we are overvaluated, undervaluated, if we are in equilibrium, etc. We few times get to point B. Very contrary, I would say, to engineers. No? Nine out of ten policy makers in China are engineers, with one <coughs> exception in the current administration, you don't find one single macroeconomist. All of them, nine out of ten, are engineers. I would say, in general, they don't care how you get from A to B. The relevant issue is to say, look, in five years, according to our quinquennial annual plan, we want to grow by so much, investment is going to be so much, etc. They don't care if it is with over, under, or whatever. No? It's not absolutely relevant, because particularly in Mexico, but I would say in Argentina, in Brazil, uh, and all over the region, again, macroeconomists determine policies, of course, economic policies, and many others. No? And particularly from a Mexican case, I would say, <laughs> we have a brief introduction, hello, what is your name, what is my name, etc. And the second question is, shall we, uh, when we get intimate, shall we sign a free trade agreement? From a Chinese perspective, this does not make too much sense. No, we can have 20 steps before that, and after that we might be able to sign such a free trade agreement. I put it a little bit ironically, but there is a lot of political economy issues behind this, which are, in my opinion, important to understand current uh, China. Secondly, and I will finish with this, although there are many other issues, I would highlight, and this is important for the discussions today in the morning, uh, that from my perspective, personally and based on the work in the last 15 years we've been working on the automobile, auto parts sector, yarn, textile, garment, pharmaceutical industry, electronics, among others, in Mexico and China, visiting firms, reviewing policies from trade, investment, R&D, etc. From a Latin American perspective, it is outstanding to understand, I would say, the omnipresence of the public sector in China. Again, for a Chinese, they would say, well, tell me something new. I grew up with that. That is not that relevant for me. But from a Latin American perspective, where in the last 30 years we have cut all what we can of the state, uh, this is very relevant. It is very relevant because the public sector, not state-owned enterprises, Chinese and many other people use the concept of state-owned enterprise. I would say that is in the best of the cases a part of the public sector, in most of the cases a small part. The public sector in China is the sum of the central government, of this of cities, extremely <coughs> relevant, which is not the same, provinces and municipalities. When you study the, uh, the commodity chain of the automobile auto parts sector, you find today that China produces 22 million cars. Who is the main producer? It's not the public, it's not the private uh, firm. It's not the state, it's not the centrally, it's not the a firm owned by the central government. So I always say, well, they come from Mars or what? No, they are from the public sector, but the first producer is Baik, no? from the only owned by and property of the Beijing government. They produce more cars than all of Mexico together. No? The second producer, Saik, 
owned by the Shanghai government. This, in Latin America, we do not understand. No? If someone in Buenos Aires would say, uh, let's produce cars, no? and that the Buenos Aires government becomes the, prop, the, the owner of a new firm that will produce cars, everybody will joke and say, come on. In the best of the cases, someone tried this several decades ago. No? So we don't understand the, the qualitative difference of the public sector in China. I was mentioning today in the morning, we've had <coughs> several dialogues with the Mexico City government and the Beijing government related to social policies, R&D policies, etc. In the science and technology issue, we, uh, six months ago, we had three or four policy makers from Beijing and from Mexico City. No? So, a good dialogue at the end. So, by the way, what is your budget? No? Uh, well, the budget of the Beijing government regarding R&D is 20 times five, 25 times higher than in Mexico City. So, again, it's not the same. But that does not include the, public, the, the firms that are being owned by the Beijing government, around seven to 800. <laughs> Only one, again, producing 3.5 million cars a, a year. No? So imagine the budget of this and other 750 firms. No? This, I believe, is not understandable today in Latin America. No? So we speak of, yes, today Xi Jinping asking or proposing more market policies, a marketization of China's uh, uh, po uh, uh, policies and the new instruments, etc. Yes, but you have to understand the starting point of the public sector, again, which I would say is absolutely omnipresent. Again, from sector to sector, from province to province, you might find differences. But if you don't understand this in terms, as we'll see in a moment, regarding foreign direct investments, etc., you are missing the story. <laughs> No? So when you are speaking of competition between a micro firm producing shoes in Leon or in Brazil or whatever and competing with a state or publicly owned firm which has financing, ports, universities, infrastructure and whatever, you need a PhD to understand what the outcome will be. This is not being good or bad, simply understanding and I believe an important issue. There are other topics that I will skip. Very interesting today in the last 18 months are the anti-corruption policies promoted by Xi Jinping that are going all over and all through the public sector, relatively coherent, having enormous impacts even for universities, for five-star hotels, suddenly uh, public uh, officials cannot stay in five-star hotels, but only three or lower regard because of these policies. No? Some debates on Latin America related to discussions today in the morning. No? First of all, huge statistical differences. In the Mexican case, not the same in Brazil, <coughs> but you will find that China says it exports around 20 billion US dollars to Mexico. Mexico says it imports from China 60 billion. No? The, rela the difference is three to one. So I always say jokingly, if you don't know if you're exporting one chicken or three chickens, you have a big problem. No? <laughs> In between, you can uh, uh, calculate whatever you want to. So it's not only an academic issue, it's a policy, very relevant policy issue. No? Um, I would say important is based on this discussion of the public sector, is that, of course, Latin America is extremely weak regarding institutions in the relationship to many topics, including China. No? So China is very easily, regarding this public sector in China, is very quick, very easy, very strong, able to propose policies and to come today with a delegation, tomorrow with another, and 20 other delegations, all 
with the same policy. In Latin America, we are experts that the trade ministry or secretary comes with one issue, a week later another delegation, they don't have a clue what the last said. Sometimes they come from the same ministry, etc., etc. So the institutional weaknesses between Latin America and China are qualitatively different by the way, having corruption, having many other issues, no? But I would say the quality and the conception of these institutions, I don't say it's good or bad, is very different, no? I would say also that with this book and other uh, contributions, we are able today to discuss a second stage of the relationship between China and Latin America. Not only yo-yo economics. No, yo-yo economics is things go up and down and down and up, and like the yo-yo. No, and, and after 45 minutes, you end up more lost than at the beginning. No, because of course you have the data from April. I come with the one with, from May, and so it goes up 2%, and then in June it goes down 15%, and you don't understand too much. No? But what you have is a first engagement in the last 10 years, I would say, regarding trade, with very clear characteristics, and the issue now is what will happen, and we have some pretty coherent results, what is happening now regarding foreign direct investment in the region from China. No? Um, other issues, uh, long discussions again, but I would say in general uh, there are strong critiques regarding the sustainability of the trade relationship between Latin America and China. This has been discussed in depth in the last 10 years by people from Argentina to Mexico. A, the region has an increasing trade deficit. B, in terms of technology, as we'll see for the case of Mexico, the relationship does not work. No? We could quote if, if old Raúl Previch would, would see the relationship between Argentina and, and Latin, uh, Argentina, Latin America and, make, and, and China, he would tell you, look, I told you, no? this is a typical core a periphery relationship. No? Latin America exports 3% of its exports, 3% have a medium and high technological level. And the exports from China to Latin America, it goes from 60 to 70%. What does this mean? What we discussed today in the afternoon. So from, from the Malvinas, I would say, to Mexicali, we're exporting soya beans, we are exporting uh, meat, uh, copper, and other minerals, and we are, in China is exporting to Latin America telecommunications, uh, PCs, laptops, uh, auto parts, automobiles, etc. In terms of value added, in terms of technology, this does not work. The first one that would understand that this is not sustainable are the Chinese, by the way. <laughs> if they would have this relationship, they would ask you to have a meeting yesterday, not tomorrow, to say, guys, what are we going to do? Because this, either we stop it yesterday or we try to change this. No? Uh, other issues, this I leave aside. China, and again I leave you the presentation. China has been growing, big deal, no? It has been growing massively, be much higher than most of Latin America. If we compare it with, Latin, with, with the case of Mexico, uh, in the, for the period 1980-2012, China grew 12.2 times more than Mexico in terms of GDP per capita. Not 12.2%, but 12.2 times more. No? So there is a, what, something is going on in China that is not going on in the rest of Latin America and Mexico. China is becoming the first trading partner of most of the countries of Latin America. By the way, having diplomatic relationships or not, we just finished now a long 
work on Guatemala and the relationship with uh, China, and without any diplomatic ties, China is the third major trading partner of Guatemala. No? And so <coughs> the, I would say the general attitude of China is if you don't want to recognize me, that's your problem, it's not mine. No? <laughs> A different attitude than five or ten years ago. Uh, this is what I meant, you know, in terms of exports from Lat Latin America and the Caribbean lack to China. Look at the lowest green-yellow line between 3 to 5 percent. You know? uh, look at the highest blue line, which is exports with medium and high technological level uh, to Latin uh, imports coming from China from Latin America between at around 60 percent. No, there is a huge gap in something that does not work. By the way, by the way, this gap is much higher or much bigger be than between uh, the United States and the rest of the world. So China is posing new questions. I would say at the end China is asking us guys, what are you going to do tomorrow? No, I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to fall, some things are not going to work, etc. But what, what do you want to do? No? Do you want to continue <coughs> with such a development model? They will tell us, hmm, again, you need a PhD to know that this is not going to work. No? Uh, finally, there is work of Kevin Gallagher and others saying that also China is getting very strong regarding financing in Latin America. In the last three or four years, China uh, is uh, financing more than the World Bank and the Inter-American Development together. No? Uh, so not completely irrelevant, no? uh, among other issues, topics. So regarding some of the results of the, of the book, why? They were the golden again. Is if you wanted to, to go beyond this yo-yo economics regarding foreign direct investment. You know, yes, China is getting important. Yes, we have some positive effects, etc. But all of this, in the most of the cases, at the macro level. No, there is very little knowledge at the meso or institutional level and practically no knowledge at the micro level. What are these firms? What are they doing? In which processes and products are they specializing? What are their problems? Uh, do you want to enhance this type of foreign direct investment? What kind of instruments do you need or not or to say no? The, the further away they are, the better, and so it's a political stance to say we don't want to have to do anything with Chinese investments and with some ideas regarding backward and forward linkages with the idea also, is our Chinese foreign direct investments different than investments from the United States, Japan, Germany and others, or is it the same story than we know? No? A, a group of five working groups in five countries, two firms by country, so you cannot generalize the story. No, if we would have had more money, we would have done it with one or two more digits, not the case. And with people, I would say, uh, that have been working on, on China for some years. No, so it's not people that for the first time said, wow, so China is growing. Oh, really? And China is exporting. Oh, really? No, it's people that have had relationship with these firms and know what we wanted to ask. Remember, China is receiving massively foreign direct investment, nothing new. After the United States, it, it's the second recipient of, of uh, uh, FDI, 121 billion in 2012. But what is absolutely new, and particularly since the crisis of 2008 2009, is China is massively exporting capital, and that is new. No? So, China is, if you want to, doing in five years what a country like Japan or Germany did in 100 years. No? And I would say, with all the mistakes, errors, learning processes, and whatever you want to. No? So, you have massive experiences at all levels. No? 
I would say that in at least in the next five years, probably this relationship, this percentage of, of the overseas foreign direct investment over FDI will be close to 100 or above 100 percent in the next five years, which means China will be exporting more capital, what it is importing, but this does not mean that China will stop importing capital. It does both. No, that is not completely irrelevant. Latin America's interest is important. By the way, the source is critical. No? And so in some cases, so here we have UNCTAD, the United Nations. In some other places here we have MOFCOM, the Chinese source. You will find different sources, again, because the difference is when you see it binationally, Chinese investment in Mexico, differences are sometimes seven or eight to one. No? So uh, if you would have a Chinese presentation here, only based on MOFCOM, you would probably have uh, differences in statistics. No, but so around 15% of Chinese foreign direct investment worldwide, 15% in the last years is in Latin America. So I would say it's important. Start looking at the small letters. No, uh, More than 90% in some years of this FDI to Latin America goes to Virgin Islands and to Cayman Islands. No? <laughs> uh, so this is interesting, also in terms of the discussion of Xi Jinping of informal, illegal and corrupt ways of doing foreign direct investment. This is a way of investing either in Latin America or bringing it back to Hong Kong and to China, not always illegal, but not always informal, etc. No? Uh, based on a clock. Uh, or CEPAL, China invested more than 40 billion US dollars until 2012. Uh, China is the third source of foreign direct investment worldwide. The first one is the US, the second Japan, the third China, and China in some years has become the second major source of FDI in Latin America. So yes, it is very important and we will have to get used and witness much more investment. There are good macroeconomic reasons. I would say like they, there was the old joke in in Brazil that Argentinians went to Brazil and asked for a TV for the price of a TV and they said give me two, no? So China today asked for the price of a mine in Australia and they will say look give me three cash no questions, no? <laughs> so China has massive uh, massive macroeconomic potential for investing. Based on some of the work I have been doing 3,000 individual transactions, firm by firm, 2000, 2012. There is a big data bank called from Thomson Reuters, very expensive, lots of work, I can assure you. I invite you to go through that. But the first qualitative relevance, no? I would say first you find that f from the total foreign direct investment from China to the world, you find that 84, 83.92% of China's foreign direct investment is being done by public firms. Again, public in terms of central government, provinces, cities, and municipalities, not only SOEs. SOEs is part of the public sector, insufficient. This makes Chinese foreign direct investment qualitatively incomparable with any other foreign direct investment. No? If you put from the United States, Japan, to, to the top 20 exporters of capital, this coefficient never is higher than 3%. <laughs> in the case of China, it is 84%. And in terms of public firms investing in Latin America, it is 87%. No? I will get back to that, but this again poses massive new political challenges, ecological challenges, legal challenges as the World Bank, and economic challenges. We, in economics, we love to say FDI is, is maximizing some kind of firm efficiencies, etc. Maybe, maybe not. No? If you have problems with a mine, a Chinese mine, where 20 people die, worst case scenario, go and discuss this with Xi Jinping, no? and let's see what you achieve. No? I know this is not absolutely new in, in, in Australia. No? 
Second major issue, like no other country, in my opinion, of the world, China, A, has a closed capital account, which means if you want to export one yuan from China to wherever, you have to go through a group of permissions, which always means, by the way, that you might get it or not. No, and this is for real. Secondly, you have an, a group of institutional filters in China that allows you to export capital and for the guys that do not understand, if you do not comply with these regulations, you are not allowed to do this. So you have institutions such as the National Development Reform Commission, very powerful, MOFCOM, several other institutions that among other things gives you warranties and, and uh, access to US dollars beyond the yuan. No? So if you do not comply with these filters, you are not allowed or don't have the possibility, and there are several interesting case studies that that, that reflects the impossibility to do a foreign direct investment if you do not comply with particular directories and case studies that are being updated annually in, in terms of what foreign direct investment, public and private, from China is allowed to do or not. That does not exist in any other country of the world of the top foreign direct investors. No? If you don't understand this, you will say, wow, how is it possible the Chinese are so coherent? No, they do really they comply with according to specific guidelines, etc. because of this. I invite you to go through some of the papers to understand the particular guidelines, directories, products and processes. They will not buy any, uh, they will say, any processes they, they, they do already have in China in terms of technology, in terms of raw material. If we have it, why are we going to lose any resources in Latin America? In the book, we study 10 cases in Argentina, Sinopec, these three firms and the respective cases. No? So we have 10 case studies. You cannot generalize them. I invite you to go through them. Uh, I, I can, I will not go, th I will only, and given also the time, I will only specialize and make some comments to the case uh, of Mexico. Uh, there are interesting uh, uh, case studies in all of them from Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, uh, and the case of Mexico. No? The case of Mexico, remember, Mexico has gone through massive structural changes in the last 10 to 15 years, not acknowledged sufficiently. Look at this in terms of the share over total trade. So the United States, the share of the US in Mexico's trade has fallen dramatically from levels above 81% at the end of the 1990s to below 64%. What is the counterpart of that? Asia, and particularly China. No, the share of China in Mexico's trade exports and imports increased from less than 1% to almost 9%. No? In terms of technology, again, you would say more or less the same story at different levels than Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and whatever you can imagine in between. No? So Mexican exports to China have a higher level than most of Latin America, but still a huge gap between exports from, from China to Mexico and the Mexican exports to China. But China does not invest so far in Mexico. No? So if you take the official uh, information of the Secretaría de Economía in Mexico, China's investments account for less than $300 million or 0.1% of total Mexico's FDI. No? So interestingly, China uh, invests more in Panama, with which it doesn't have any diplomatic ties, than in Mexico. Some of the results, no, this I will, I will go to the case studies. The two cases we study, and I did the study for the case of Mexico, one of them is Huawei, I'm sorry for the spelling mistake. Fun, a beautiful case study, very interesting, no? It's uh, one of the big uh, transnational corporations of in, in China, 
very non-Chinese, you would say. No? You would expect if you want to massive uh, production lines and producing equipment, no. More than 55% of, of labor power of Huawei, uh, 170,000 workers worldwide, 55% works on R&D. No? Not on equipment, no production lines, putting, assembling, uh, harnesses, etc. In Mexico, it has today, I know the, the, the case since its beginning in 2001, it has around 1,600 employees and the small production line in Guadalajara, 600 kilometers away from, from Mexico. No? Uh, interesting in, in this chart, the lower part, is that it is expecting that in the next five years it will reduce the share of the businesses and equipment it, provi it provides to carriers and it wants to specialize much more in processes directly with, with firms. Uh, in Mexico, interestingly, and a story that is not very well known, Huawei is the main supplier of all the carriers in, in telecommunications. In less than 10 years, it has displaced the major suppliers historically from the United States and Ericsson in Europe, and Huawei has become the main one. Remember, it was blocked two years ago by the US Congress uh, for national security reasons. A beautiful paper, if you can uh, read this paper of the Congress <coughs> of the United States, fantastic. No, they say at one point, I quote it there, we don't understand Chinese capitalism. No? So the guy, the founder of Huawei, used to work at the People's Liberation Army, so he could have links to the People's Liberation Army. No? And they have their headquarters in Shenzhen, so they could have have relations with the Shenzhen government. And so it's full of, and they could have, they don't show, prove anything. No? What this proved is that the NSA, they got into the server of Huawei and missed and meddled around there. No? Interestingly also, so there is a conflict because, again, main provider of telecommunications in the, in the, in, in the in telecommunications in Mexico and not being allowed to enter the U.S. market. The final goal of Huawei is, of course, not Mexico, where they have the headquarters for Latin America, but of course it's the United States. And as we know, telecommunications don't care too much about a particular border where they say Mexico and United States. So if the US wants it or not, Huawei is entering the US market through several of the Mexican firms. I believe very interesting in terms of rules of origin, and there is a huge potential. They want to comply with NAFTA <laughs> rules of origin. Today, they don't. The other interesting case is Giant Motors uh, de Latino America, which is not a Chinese foreign direct investment, but which is a strategic association shown between Grupo Carso, Grupo Carso is owned the property of Carlos Slim, which in Mexico is not completely irrelevant, no? <laughs> uh, to put it politely, no? Uh, and foul trucks that nobody knows, but is the main producer of light trucks in the world. 98% of this production is being sold in China. That's why nobody knows it. They produce 2 million light trucks in China, the rest in the rest of the world. And a fantastic dial uh, dialogue, if you want to. Uh, I know the, 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 the pro uh, Elias Masri uh, for, for more than a decade. A uh, learning and a dialogue process in terms of this tropicalization of the light trucks coming from China to be sold in Mexico. No? So in China they used to have the engine where you, below the seat, which makes sense in, in, in Beijing at minus 10 degrees, but not in Veracruz where you have 40 degrees. No? So if uh, above that you have the, the motor below your butt, no? <laughs> uh, it doesn't make it possible. Sending materials during five or six years where they mm. didn't, didn't have a clue, they didn't understand what they want, etc. And at the end, I would say, look at the productivity rate. 
From 2008 to 2014, seven years, they increased productivity by 19 times. No? Again, this is part of this dialogue of tropicalizing a product that, first of all, they said, look, I sent you whatever I can. No? And in Mexico, they said it doesn't work, and it took three months and whatever. And you have a very beautiful, interesting case <coughs> where the Chinese and the Mexican learn. Again, the goal of the Chinese firm is to, comp to, to fulfill the, the rules of origin of NAFTA. No? And there is a huge potential with Grupo Carso there. I finish. Uh, lots of different results, I would say, based on, on the book. In general, I would say today, five years of Chinese foreign direct investment in Latin America, there is no qualitative difference between foreign direct investment from other countries and uh, the Chinese one. On the contrary, today, the national uh, value added and the national linkages that Chinese firms have generated, I would say, although it's different, difficult to account for, but I would say in general might be even lower than all from other nationalities. However, result B is these firms are searching, like in the Mexican case, to comply with the rules of origin. What does this concretely mean? Concretely, it means that these firms are looking for suppliers all over to according to specific products and processes. Again, there are huge differences between the auto parts sector, telecommunications, Lenovo, and many others. No? So the, I would say the policy challenge in Mexico and most of Latin America is today. In five years, they would have learned. And so they will put their headquarters from Mexico to Miami, why? Because Mexico is, from their perspective, a lost case. No? And they will go to Miami and say, look, goodbye Latin America, and from Miami I do all Central America, Mexico, and, and South America. No? But so today they are looking to comply with these rules of origin. So there is a huge potential for concrete policies. I would say against my dear colleagues, macroeconomists, traders, and whatever that say after 500 pages, and as a result to overcome all these problems, we need an industrial policy. That's my starting point. What we need is Huawei today has these particular products and processes, and I don't care if it's an industrial policy or whatever. They need policies regarding training, skills, and particular products and processes. Today, tomorrow it will be different. And different than Volkswagen, for example. Volkswagen in Mexico has been working for 60 years, and they, they know what they get in Mexico. You, you cannot teach them anything. No? So there is a massive policy spectrum to say, do we want to enhance foreign direct investment from China? We can start from these firms and go on. The other way would say, no, look, we don't want these guys. No? And so let them do whatever they want to. We're not going to support their work, etc. So there are a lot of, of differences, again, on, on, on foreign direct investment by firm uh, in the respective regions. Very interesting, the case also of two automobile firms in, in, in Uruguay that wanted to invest or invested in Uruguay, Lifan and Cherry. And from Uruguay, they wanted to export to Brazil. Uh, the Brazilians, after six months, said, no, my friends, if you want to export to Brazil, you have to invest in Brazil. No? And so they said, but look, according to your rules in Mercosur, you say this, they said, look, you have to understand a little bit beyond the rules and legalities. And so they invested quite a bit of money. And again, I think there is a huge potential for instruments for future Chinese FDI, also in the private sector, based on what China has been doing. Today, I would say again, FDI from China apparently reinforces trade structures today. But if policymakers from Argentina to Brazil to Mexico want to change this, they have to negotiate very harshly, very 
to the head and we do it in the academic sector every day. You know? We receive academic delegations from China that want to sign some kind of cooperation agreements and say, look, we love your center and we love UNAM and we love Mexico. So uh, we need a cooperation agreement. Please sign here in the lower part. You know? So we want to spend nine days in Cancun and on Sunday from nine to 10 o'clock at noon, uh, we want to be at your center. You know? So you have to tell them, look, my friends, this is not ethical. <laughs> and today I'm not going to sign this. You know? And so if the public sector is not able to do that, to negotiate politically very harshly, the result will be what we're witnessing these days. No, thank you very much.